Good afternoon, respected keynote speaker, honorable session chair, respected kids, and dear students. Hopefully you are doing well in this pandemic. I take privilege to welcome you all to today's keynote session of the International Conference on Science and Contemporary Technologies, ICSCD 2021, organized by Bangladesh University of Business and Technology, BUBT. This is Dr. Mohammad Shamsul Arbin, Assistant Professor, Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering, BUBT, and coordinator of today's keynote session on role of the smart grid in facilitating the integration of renewables. First of all, let me explain the outline of today's session. Speech duration will be 45 minutes, followed by QA session for 10 minutes, plus five minutes for offering appreciation certificate and group photo session. Now, I'd like to introduce our honorable session chair, Professor Dr. Mohammad Fayez Khan. Professor Dr. Mohammad Fayez Khan is the Honorable Vice Chancellor of UBT and the Professor of Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering. Professor Dr. Khan is, is specialized in the field of power system, renewables, and energy conversion. Now, may I request the Honorable Session Chair to conduct the session, please. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Arifin. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and warm welcome to you all to this keynote session. Now, let me introduce the respected keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Saifur Rahman, and his presentation topic. Can you show the presentation topic first? Screen. Hello, Yasin? It is on the screen. It's on the screen. Okay, okay, okay fine. So I continue. Uh, I think uh, Professor Dr. Saifur Rahman needs no introduction. Uh, he is well known throughout the world. Anyhow, for our new generation, I would like to say a few words about Professor Dr. Saifur Rahman. Professor Rahman is the Joseph Loring Professor in the Department of ECE, Virginia Tech, USA. He'll be talking on role of the smart grid in facilitating the integration of renewables. First of all, I would like to highlight a few words regarding our keynote speaker. Professor Saifur Rahman is the founder director of the Advanced Research Institute at Virginia Tech, USA, where he is the Joseph R. Loring, Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He also directs the Center for Energy and the Global Environment. He is a life fellow of the IEEE and an IEEE Millennium Medal winner. He was the president of IEEE Power and Energy Society for 2018 and 2019. He was the founding editor-in-chief of the IEEE Electrification Magazine and the IEEE Transaction on Sustainable Energy. He has published over 150 journal papers and has made over 500 conferences and invited presentations. In 2006, he served on the IEEE Board of Directors as the Vice President for Publications. He is a distinguished lecturer for the IEEE Power and Energy Society and has lectured on renewable energy, energy efficiency, smart grid, energy internet, blockchain, IoT sensor integration, etc. But in over 30 countries. That's why I, I have told that. He's well known throughout the world. He's the founder of BEM Controls, LLC, a Virginia-based software company providing building energy management solutions. He served as the chair of the US National Science Foundation Advisory Committee for International Science and Engineering. He has conducted several energy efficiencies, blockchain sensor integration projects for Duke Energy, Tokyo Electric Power Company, the US National Science Foundation, the US Department of Defense, the US Department of Energy, and the state of Virginia. He has a PhD in electrical engineering from Virginia Tech. Now I would invite Professor Saifur Rahman to deliver his keynote speech on role of the smart grid in facilitating 
the integration of renewables. Our session time is up to 5.30 p.m. in which 45 minutes for keynote speech and 15 minutes for question and answers. Uh, Professor Rahman, we are now eagerly waiting to, to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fayaz, for the very kind introduction. Appreciate it. Those of you who do not know, Fayaz and I grew up very close to each other in Dhanmundi yeah. Elephant yeah. area. So I've known Fayaz for, I don't know, 50 years maybe? Yes, yes, roughly, <laughs> a century. So, so this, it's my pleasure that we are uh, together again. It's, it's still virtually. So I see your logo, B-U-B-T. Reminds me B-U-E-T, but we all went to college. So Buet and B-U-B-T, very close name. So I'm very pleased, happy, and honored that I'm able to come before you today and talk about my very interesting and pleasant and, and, and uh, exciting research field, renewable energy and smart grid. And I would like to start my discussion with the few words that you will see on the screen very soon, where I have been working on renewable energy and a smart grid for more than 10 years now. So Fayaz, can you see my full screen? Uh, can you maximize it? No, I, it's I, already I think... maximum. Can I see that? I'm just seeing maybe, maybe it's this problem with my, com uh, with my desktop. No, let me see, let me see. Let me go back, hold on. One second. Let me go back and reshare. Maybe it's on my side. Give me a second. I think it was okay. Uh, it's okay, I think. Uh, it's, it's no, now it is not okay, but it was okay before. It was, uh, now it is okay now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Perfect. It's change, changing? Changing? Yeah, yeah, it's changing. it's changing. Okay, okay, fine. So, sorry about the confusion. So, the two... Keywords I would like to focus on today, maybe next 35, 40 minutes. One is smart grid. What is smart grid? How does it work? And renewables are there, they're intermittent. How can smart grid help to integrate renewables into the power grid? Bangladesh will have the same challenge going forward because Bangladesh as a country is focusing more and more on solar energy. This problem today exists in parts of China because of heavy wind, parts of US, parts of India, parts of Germany, parts of Denmark that I know for sure. Example, Denmark at nighttime has more wind energy than the country's total system load. More wind than whole countries load in Denmark. So in daytime, it's a shortfall. So what do they do? At night, when Denmark has excess electricity from wind power, after meeting their country's full demand, they send the power back to Norway at night. Norway is mainly hydro. So they hold the water back at night and absorb low cost wind energy. Daytime, when Denmark needs extra power, Norway will release the extra water that it held last night and supply Denmark. This ideal example of how two renewables can help each other. Bangladesh is not same situation, but Bangladesh has two interconnections in India right now, one on the Kumilla side, one on the um, Karamara side. So those could be used to exchange power. So I am saying this because we cannot solve the global energy problem using renewables unless we have strong interconnections so that when one party is, is short, other party can help each other. That's the theory you got to build up. So my point is, it's a geopolitical issue. That you cannot solve your energy problem by yourself. No country is fully satisfied with their sources. You say, okay, Saudi Arabia, a lot of oil, why is Saudi Arabia today spending so much money for solar? They are. So this is the issue that there are some issues are going to be there forever. And some issues will change their shape based on the global mix. That's the item. Anyway, 
If you want to know more, I gave you at the bottom of my screen, my, my website. I have given many lectures on this topic and other topics that Fai has mentioned. All of those are on my website. If you have time, please go look at it. Now, we as engineers, if you hear something new, we'll ask, please define it for me. What do you mean by this? So question is, what is a smart grid? Smart grid is a concept with many elements who are monitoring and control of each element in the chain of generation, transmission, distribution, and end use, allow delivery and use to be more efficient. Two keywords, delivery and use, more efficient. That means on the use side, you have to be careful as well. You know, energy efficiency is a big delight to a lot of work on energy efficiency now. If you want to meet your country's need with non-fossil generation, you must also focus on making your load more efficient, meaning use less electricity to meet your building demand. That's another lecture I gave, that's a different story. My point is, if you want to talk about smart grid, take advantage of the smart grid, both for supply efficiency and delivery efficiency. That's the bottom line. Now you can tell, I have now told you what is a smart grid as it's a concept. Why? Because you, cannot, you can never achieve smart grid 100%. There's always something more you can do. So I say it is as nirvana. You want to get there, but you can never get there for 100%. You always do something more. You'll see as my talk progresses what I mean by this. So that's the issue of smart grid definition. Now, what do you mean by grid? This picture is the power grid. Bangladesh has 230 kV, even 400 kV coming from India for the, uh, for the uh, interconnection. That's a power grid. Power grid is already very smart, already. It has advanced technology, communication, all of that. Then what are we talking about in smart grid? To me, grid is not just the power line, even though the word grid means that. We got natural gas grid, power grid, telecom grid. So what is the issue then? The issue is, what are you trying to do? We're trying to make the grid smarter, safer, reliable, and more cost-effective using advanced sensors, communication technologies, and distributed computing. If you see all these, that's not the grid only. In Bangladesh, our grid is very strong, big high voltage grid. But why do you lose power almost a few times a month? I go to Gazipur, Gazipur, they lose power every day. Government is every day. See, so the grid is smart, why lose power? Issue is here. You are losing power because your rest of the network, which is mainly distribution, is not reliable, not safe, not smart. That's where you have to focus. And that's where most of the renewables come in. When you put grid-based solar, they're not connected to 230 kV, they're connected to your 11 kV substation level. That's where the grid has to be focused on. You also notice I put the word cost-effective with the red li lines. Why? I didn't say cheap. Smart grid is very, very expensive, not cheap. But it is cost-effective because you can do more with it. You can do energy efficiency, you can do load control, you can do billing, you can do remote management. All of that is possible because smart grid provides you that technology. Now, to me, this is how I define smart grid for non-engineers. On the left-hand side is normal telephone. Fayaz will remember this, I remember that. Yes, yes, I very much remember <laughs> Most of the people today would not remember this. <laughs> On the, and that's a good phone. If you make a good call, use that phone. The voice is very clear, even today in the hacker. On the right-hand side, the iPhone. The phone on the left, the black rotary dial costs $15, 1515 today, or to the market price. iPhone 12 costs $1,200. If you want to make a phone call, 
why spend 80 times more money, 15 and 100, 1, 2, 0, 0? Why? Because this phone on the right lets you do, lets you do WhatsApp. I can do my seminar on, on this phone. I can check my time, I can check my pulse. I can do a PowerPoint presentation. I can check my, uh, check my uh, stock pricing, all of that. Point is, if something gives you much higher level of service, you're willing to pay for it. And when iPhone came out in 2007, they did not advertise anything. They just put in the market. People waited in line for like five, 10, 20 hours to buy an iPhone and pay at the time was like 600 bucks. So point is money is not the issue. Issue is value. So when somebody, and I live in Japan for a year, Japan, unlike US, in US tells them, tell somebody something, yes, how much does it cost? First question, how much does it cost? In Japan, tell them about something new, they don't say cost, they say, how, what does it do for me? First question, tell me what does it for, then I talk about money. So that's what I should suggest here for young generation. Change your frame of mind. When you hear something new, see something different, you're offered something, don't say, how much does it cost? This is a different issue. This, if you talk about cost, nobody will buy the iPhone. They'll all buy the black iPhone. So that's the thought I have for non-engineers. Now, so what is then the starting point and the ending point of a smart grid? Grid is supplying power to you. So on the left-hand side, I have the power plant generator, then long distance transmission line, then distribution network, bring power to the local neighborhood, then your building, like your campus building, your home, my home, and then finally end use device, air conditioner, refrigerator, light, whatever it is. So I say smart grid starts at the generator and ends at the refrigerator. That's the span of a smart grid. So we have to be using the benefits, the technology, the algorithms of smart grid in all of those devices going forward. Now, so if, we can, if I can go forward now, these are the building blocks of smart grid. Starts with technology at the top. That means smart meter, smart switches, smart distribution uh, circuits. Those exist today. In, even talk, I can, you can probably get smart, smart meters. Okay, that exists. In order for any technology to grow and expand, it has to be working under some standards because Siemens makes smart meters. Many other companies, China makes a lot of smart meters. How do I know the Desco in Dhaka, whose smart meter they will buy? They can buy from many sources. How do you know they'll work together? That means all the smart meters today in the world are built based on certain standards. That's important. That work is pretty much done by now. We have standards on smart devices all over. Then rates and regulations. This is happening in Bangladesh now to some extent. If you want to encourage use of electricity, during off-peak hours, you must give some incentives. Like in Bangladesh today, generally speaking, power is short at six o'clock to nine o'clock, typically in summer days, and excess power at night. If you want to encourage the government industry to work more at night and less from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., they would not do it unless you give them incentive. You give them low price power at night, they will use it then, or even you can encourage them to use batteries to store power at night and using the battery stored energy during peak hours to do this. That's rates and regulations. Why is it important? Because if you want to change people's behavior, incentivize them and give them technology. So the power smart meter can play that role later on. I'll talk more about this. Finally, the bottom bar is consumer awareness and education. If the public doesn't know all this thing I've talked about here, they don't care. So to make smart grid a reality, it's a challenge in the US as well. You have to 
make your consumer aware of the benefits like the pricing difference at night, like the issue of peak load supply is difficult. Even in the US, in Virginia, a very hot summer day, the power supply is kind of very tight from 3 to 6 p.m. or summer days, that's when the power company brings in the gas turbine. It's very expensive. So if they could tell me through the smart meters and a signal, they can do it now, that peak period is coming, please cut down your demand at this time. Cut down by demand means I don't run the AC as much. I don't, I don't uh, use my water heater. I don't charge my electric car. Those are the awareness issues that has to happen. So my point is we must have all of these boxes, consumer awareness, education, rates and regulations, standards, technology to make the smart grid complete. That's what I said. You can always do more with pricing and consumer awareness. So keep working on that so that we have a functional smart grid. Now, how is the grid evolving? Today? On the top third of my screen is, I said, before smart grid. Before smart grid means, this is what, in, if you look at PDB, it looks like this. Power station. Hello, just a minute. Hello, yes, Okay. Uh, you have the standard power station, power plant. This is common. Transformer step up voltage for transmission long distance. You carry the power long distance. It come close to your uh, local area substation. Step down, then send the power to the local building. This is normal. It's happening in the last hundred some years now. Below the lower half of my screen, but after smart grid, what are different items here? Two-way power flow, multi-stakeholder interaction. Two-way power flow, what do you mean by two-way power flow? If you have, and in Dhaka City some years ago, the power company required for new buildings, especially uh, multi-story uh, buildings to have rooftop solar. So they could sell, send power back to the grid if needed. That's two-way power flow. Smart meter can keep track of that. Now, if you look at my picture here, I have on the middle left-hand side, power station, I have factories, I have transmission lines, I have big office buildings, I have houses, I have electric vehicle, the green car, in the middle storage battery, left to that is wind power, next above so the battery is solar power, and so on and so forth. Also you have dotted blue lines. This is new. In smart grid, we must have full communication connecting all loads and all generation. The load is high, generation has to take, take care of it and vice versa. This is a new part. That means I have to have full integrated communications. Now, if I look at my next slide, I have to merge power flow with information flow. This is new part, information flow. That means I must have communication that is integrated. If I look at my next picture, this is what I call electric power infrastructure. We know this, right? Power station on the upper left, step up transformer, long distance transmission line, distribution substation, receiving station, the local your local distribution network. Then you got buildings, you got some have rooftop solar, factory, commercial building, some may have flywheel, fuel cell, all of that. Why do I say flywheel and fuel cell? There is a data center here where I, near where I live of AOL data center. They have full backup diesel engines. They need very high reliability. Then they back it up with battery and then back it up with flywheels. So servers are all backed up flywheel, battery, diesel, and power company supplied power. That's how they give you six nines, 11, 999.9999. So this is happening today. Expensive, but for AOL and Google and the, and the rest, if you lose power for five seconds, you get upset. They cannot do that. They lose power for maybe 0.1 second per year, very small number. Anyway, this is the 
power infrastructure. Now I will superimpose on this power infrastructure my information infrastructure. Difference you notice here, the information infrastructure has arrows going both ways, back and forth. That's because information has to flow from the power company to my meter, my house is a smart meter here. So they can ping the meter to see the voltage, frequency, current, and all that. They can do that remotely. Similarly, I can ask the power company to give me the local price at this time. The price is high, I will use less electricity. That's two-way communication. How does the information infrastructure work? Some of you are telecom people here on the screen, and I'm sure you would you would know how the information flows. In my case, for my house example, my meter is transmitting information through local microwave mesh network. Power company has put a mesh network, it can collect information from my power meter, mesh network. That mesh network collects data from about 100 homes and buildings goes to a data concentrator. From data concentrator, the data goes to the substation through GPRS, mobile phone network. So this is not part of the company's system. This is they borrow from the local phone company. Once the information goes to the substation, from then it goes to the control center using the power company's installation of their own fiber network. The fiber network from the power company control center to the substation, substation to the data concentrator, GPRS, mobile network, and then the concentrator to the home, GPRS. So uh, microwave network. That's how you set up. That's why I say this is important. You must have reliable and low cost information infrastructure to make it happen. So when you talk about smart grid, don't talk about power only. Communication is part of it. Oh, now, this is my vision for the future. I believe, slow, sorry, I believe globally and slowly, maybe in the next 10 years, the power network will look like this. We'll have a collection of intelligent, integrated microgrids. Inter integrated means, you see, I have here shown, shown one, two, three, four microgrids. If I focus on the top one, which is a small microgrid, has four homes, could be 40 homes, doesn't matter, and they have rooftop solar and electric vehicle. On the right-hand side, another smaller microgrid, it has rooftop solar and battery backup. The one in the middle is a bigger microgrid, it connected to big buildings, wind power supply, uh, trans lower right hand side, transformer, transmission lines. It is connecting power to all other microgrids. Why is it important? Even today in the US, we design microgrids. We never make it 100% self sufficient because it's too expensive. We always leave the top 20% unknown, meaning if I lose power, I cannot supply everybody 100%. So what I do, I cut some load and borrow some from neighboring microgrids. That's the concept here. So we'll have battery, if you see the lower level microgrid, the small one, it has battery, it has, the modem picture here means they must be fully interconnected communication wise. That's what I mean by this modem picture. Again, point is the blue lines are telecom lines, red lines are power lines. So that's what we have to do going forward. Okay, so this is the discussion on a smart grid. We've seen that quite a bit. Now let's talk about the renewable energy part. I showed two pictures here, one upper left, offshore wind. In Virginia, we have built two offshore wind. Okay, and then on the upper right hand side is a picture from Tokyo where they have a lot of rooftop solar. And then 
electric vehicle. Why I show this picture? Because electric vehicle is a load, also can be a source. If you come home with electric car used for half a day or whole day, doesn't matter, your car may have still have 50% charge left. Look at a Tesla car, it's a 60 kilowatt, 80 kilowatt hour battery, 80 kilowatt hour battery. If you use half of it, 40 kilowatt hour left. Your house may be taking 10 kilowatts. That means you can run your house 10 kilowatt load using battery for four hours. That's how the car becomes a source. That's called vehicle to grid example. Anyway, that's the starting discussion about renewables. Now, renewables we know, like wind and solar, for example, intermittent. There's no guarantee of wind at 9 p.m. today at a given speed. That's one. Second, if hydro is not intermittent, but space limited. You can put hydro inside Dhaka City, for example. Or you can put hydro, you can put solar or wind if you want to. That means even though resource is free, it is not always usable, right? Because it is nighttime, no sun, a wind is not there, hydro not locally available. These are my challenges. How I deal with it that, and how smart grid helps. We'll talk about that going forward. Now, so going forward in our case, let's talk about wind energy first. What are the issues of intermittency in wind? I'll give you four data sets for four seasons in Northwestern US, power company they're called BPA, Bonneville Power Administration. I've taken a typical day in January. Typical day means this day looks like most of the days in the, in the month. You see the demand is a blue line, this is winter time, so some heating demand, morning peak and evening peak. That's normal in the US, winter time. The red line showing the wind power output for the same day. You see wind output peaks at about 2 p.m. when the demand is the lowest. That means wind is not meeting your demand in terms of shape, not size, shape wise. That's January, winter time. If I go to the next one, which is springtime, April, again, typical day, still some heating load exists. That's why I have two peaks, but demand is less, right? In the, it's about peak is 7,000. Here peak was about 9,200. That's normal. Peak is less, but wind is very different now. This is a typical spring day wind in Washington state. Here we have, Peak wind at early in the morning, one o'clock, two o'clock, demand is the least, it doesn't match. The whole day the demand is changing, but wind output slowly goes down. The evening peak, the wind demand is, wind output is very low, peak demand is high at 8 p.m. Doesn't work, that is, that is a case in spring. If I show you the data for summer, July, summer load is, flat, long peak because of air conditioning load, no heating load anymore. That's typical. So again, about 8,000 megawatt peak load. Wind energy is very different. During six, uh, five o'clock, six o'clock, my demand is high, wind is the least. And more at nighttime now. Highest wind output was at midnight, that, that typical day. That's in July. Let's look at the next season, which is fall, autumum. October, it's a little bit better. Again, the dual peak is back in the blue line because of the heating demand is coming back. Now, the wind is high in early morning till about four o'clock in the day, pretty good. So wind is covering part of my peak demand. My point is, wind is useful, but not always equally valuable because of the shape change. That's wind for a daily output. Let's look at wind for a shorter term variation. This is data from Texas, 150 megawatt. Wind farm in Texas. I'm showing you minute by minute variation of wind power in Texas, where the 150 megawatt wind farm is operating. You'll see on the left-hand side of my screen, the wind output was about 140, 135 peak, about two in the morning. Then at five o'clock, wind drops from 150 to 
43 megawatt drop in one minute. Power for your system load, you do not work. You can say, well, I'll put batteries there. It's a possibility. Again, so this is the drop in wind energy in one minute in Texas. If I look at the next one, even more serious, 10 minutes. Here in 10 minutes is real data done from the 150 megawatt wind farm. In 10 minutes, early in the morning, it dropped by 113 megawatts. The 135 stable for quite a bit, then goes to uh, like 30 megawatts. How can you supply your system with this kind of system operation? Not possible. Then again, after two hours, it went up by 106 megawatts in 10 minutes. If battery is a possibility, there should be other things as well. My point is this is what wind does for me. Okay, going forward, let's look at longer term. This is the daily data in Texas again. So early in Texas, not just wind, it's not just wind, one wind farm, many wind farms. See the capacity was 4,541 megawatts, many wind farms to put together in Texas. In the morning hours of the 1st of January, 2008, here it doesn't matter, it's just typical number. We're getting about 2,200 megawatt in the morning. Day, the day progresses drops to about 100 megawatt by 11 o'clock and then stays fairly low. Day one, day two, 2nd January, stayed fairly low, be, below 500 most of the day, then slowly goes up to 2000 over the next eight, 10 hours. Next one, day three, wind is pretty full, very good, right? Pretty full for almost most of the day. Day four, pretty full. This is when I show this picture. If you tell me that I will buy batteries to fill up this gap, you can. But then those batteries are not useful anymore next two days. You invested on batteries so much, not fully used. Any investment you make, if you're not using it fully, it is not giving you a return you want. That means buying a lot of batteries is not a good solution. We'll talk about other ways to fix this. Okay, that was, that was when. This is now solar. This is my building at Virginia Tech where I work. I put rooftop solar. It's very clean because it rain washes it. This is a typical summer sunny day. This is how it looks like. I also have sunny days in winter. This is how it looks like this. Sunny day, winter time. Now, when I had this picture, I was getting full output. Now, even though it's sunny, I get no output. So what is the problem. Problem is, again, it's not just sunny day issue. In Bangladesh has, doesn't have this problem, I know that, but many countries do. So what happens on a day like this, even though it's sunny, I have no power. What do I do? Well, look at some data now from this rooftop solar. It's a small system, our six kilowatt capacity, small system. So day one through day seven, you can see how the power output is uh, doing very well. Most days over 5,000 what more than 80 percent and it's fine on a clear sunny week if i go to another week which is not so sunny i get 2000 watt 3000 watt 4000 watt so this is the challenge how i deal with this if i depend on solar for my building i got to get power from somebody else that's a weekly data if i show you the data for a day this is a sunny day but some clouds moving in and out not bad if i could manage with a battery some of these fluctuations i'm in good shape however if i look at a cloudy day this is not battery battery driven is not enough here because i need something more those are the, my challenges so these are my solution set first is battery you talked about this then i have what is called pumped storage hybrid it's not Kapai power plant in Bangladesh. Palm storage hydro means you got two reservoirs. One at the bottom, you see at the bottom, the tree and all that. One at the mountain top, another reservoir. During nighttime when the load is low, you'll use the generator as a pump. Same equipment is as pump and I have six big tubes or pipes taking water to the upper reservoir at nighttime and hold it there. 
during daytime, I have some power from the lower reservoir, but most of the water that I held stored last night are coming down, giving me power during peak hour. That's one solution. It takes about two to four hours to switch. You cannot pump and then generate right away because of the water has to come back now, two to four hours. Battery, reaction time, few seconds, right? On the lower right-hand side, I have something else called compressed air storage. That means I can store air, compressed air in a cave in the ground and use that compressed air to run a gas turbine when the demand is high. Why is it important? You may know a gas turbine requires compressed air to function, compressed air to function, right? So what happens typically when the gas turbine is about to come on, it has to use electricity from the grid to compress the air and then run it. In my case, I have kept the compressed air in the cave ready to come out without requiring power from the grid to run the generator. These are the options. Now, coming to the end of my talk now. So as you have understood by now, we say we have a changing paradigm in the power system. What is changing? Historically, demand-driven supply. That means a power company makes a load forecast for next week, next month, next year, and so on and so forth. Based on that forecast, they keep, keep their generation ready. The long-term forecast, multi-year, will build new power plants to meet the demand. That's going on for many, many years. The new reality is supply-driven demand. Why I said supply-driven demand? Because my supply is now unknown. Before demand was unknown, supply was adjusting. Why supply is unknown? Because of the, we saw the wind and solar, unknown. That means my demand has to make adjustments two ways, by controlling some load and use some battery storage, short term. So this is the new thing. I call this my smart grid ecosystem. So what is a smart grid ecosystem? Here it is. Ecosystem starts as smart buildings. In my yellow circle. Building has to be intelligent. As I said, you adjust your load. If in my case, in my building, solar is intermittent, I can change my light intensity. I can change my thermostat control. I can change my ventilation fan speed so that I can adjust my demand based on the supply fluctuation. I call it building automation system, smart devices, productive users, grid integrator. What do you mean by productive users? If your solar is not there, building is hard, people don't work. So my point is I want to make the building comfortable, productive by making adjustments. Anyway. So multiple smart buildings will give you a smart campus, like Word Campus in Dhaka. Then Dhaka can become a smart city if I have all these interconnections, making a smart meter, smart grid working together. And then PDB as a whole can be a smart grid. So it has to be ICT support. I noticed in your uh, cover page, ICT ministry is a co-sponsor. This is their job. The ICT is a very integral part of smart grid. Without ICT, it doesn't exist. So this is a smart building. Smart building has heating, ventilation and conditioning, lighting, water supply, sensor network, security camera, fire emergency. All of that has to be functioning from a single platform. That's how I control everything in a smart building. So this is where I am going to finish. This is me. I have given you my email address, my website, and I am on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. You can find me there as well. As many of you may or may not know, I'm running for IEEE president this year. So Bangladesh has over 1,000 voting members. So let your friends know. Election starts on August 16th and go on for six weeks. So I hope everybody will vote in Bangladesh. Doesn't matter whom you vote for, vote for someone. Please vote. So I'm going to stop here, Fayaz, and Thank stop you. sharing into Q&A now. Thank you very much.